When Jesus taught his first lesson on prayer, he did not give us an acrostic, a rubric, or a mnemonic. He gave us a mandate. Pray the kingdom first. And he did not give us this mandate because we need to learn to put the kingdom before our needs. He gave us this mandate because the kingdom is our greatest need. He gave us this mandate because what we need most is the Father, His kingdom, and His righteousness. As we have looked at this model prayer that Jesus provided for us in the first lesson, we recognized the what? We are to pray the kingdom first. In the second lesson, we learned the why. Because we need the Father first. In this lesson, I want us to consider the how. How? Do I pray the kingdom first? And I want to warn you as we begin this morning, those first two lessons, those were the fun lessons. Those were the easy lessons. This, this is the hard lesson. And so, before we get into it, would you pray with me? Holy God, we want to seek your kingdom first. We want to pray your kingdom first. And yet, while our spirit is willing, our knowledge and understanding is weak. And we struggle, Lord. We struggle to put your kingdom first in our praying. We play so many mind games with ourselves and our own desires and our passions and our pleasures. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether what we're seeking is your kingdom or our passion. And so we pray, Father, for your wisdom. You promised, Lord God, that for those who ask in faith, you would provide wisdom without reproach. And so we ask for it. We ask for wisdom that we might know how to pray your kingdom first because, in fact, Lord, your kingdom must come and spread throughout this world and reign here on earth as it is in heaven. Our desire is to take no rest and to give you no rest until, Lord, you have made your kingdom the jewel in the crown of your hand and you demonstrate it to the world that we are not the forsaken, but we are the beloved and that it does matter who your God is. And we pray, Father, that through our praying and through our living, the world may know that you alone, Yahweh, Lord God, are God most high. Give us understanding. Give us discipline. That we might pray your kingdom first. It's through your son Jesus, our king, we pray. Amen. So as we consider this idea of praying the kingdom first, let me share with you the struggle. Here's, or, this is my struggle. I don't know, maybe it won't be your struggle, but this is my struggle, and I fear that I may not be the only one. So as I was studying, and I recognized what Jesus' model prayer was really saying, and as I recognized in that prayer that what we were seeing was the key to prayer is praying the kingdom first. Guys, I have to tell you, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. I mean, it was like fireworks were just exploding in my head and in my heart. It was wonderful. It was like I had uncovered a treasure hidden in a field. I finally, I thought, had figured out the secret, the key to prayer and therefore to a strong relationship with God. It was wonderful. Until I actually got down on my knees to try to start praying. Because I'm just going to be honest with you, in that moment, all of a sudden... I no longer knew what to pray. I, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to say. Here's the deal. Prior to recognizing that what Jesus teaches us in this prayer is, is the first lesson, my idea was that 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 was the first lesson in prayer. 
You may not remember that this comes from 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, but I dare say you've heard this, and I dare say you've heard this from me in context of prayer. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Now, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, please understand this is a great lesson on prayer. But it is not the first lesson on prayer. And so the issue is, is that when I thought this was the first lesson on prayer, praying was easy. I only had one question to ask. What do I care about? If I care about it, pray about it. And that's easy. The thing is, once I recognize that this is not the first lesson on prayer, and that the first lesson on prayer is kingdom first praying, I have to start asking other questions. I am forced to start asking other questions. I naturally start asking other questions. I don't simply ask, what do I care about? I now have to ask, well, why do I care about this? And not only do I have to ask, why do I care about this? I have to ask, what should I care about this? Is my care... A kingdom first care? Is the thing I'm caring about kingdom first? And suddenly I'm not sure what to pray. Let me see if I can give you a practical example of this. A friend of mine comes up to me and says, Edwin, I have a thorn in the flesh. Please pray that my thorn in the flesh would be removed. Pray for me because of this thorn in the flesh. And of course, what am I going to say? Well, yes, brother, sister, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. And so I pray that the thorn would be removed because I care. I care about the pain that my brother or sister is experiencing. I care about the struggle and the trauma that it's causing. And what I want for them is, well, I would like for things to be better. I feel for them. And so I care and I pray. But what if, like Paul... In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's that thorn in the flesh that is keeping them close to the Lord God. Is it a kingdom first prayer in that situation for me to pray that the thorn be removed? Of course not. And so, what do I pray? Do I pray, Lord, make sure they keep their thorn in the flesh? Perhaps. But what if Satan is using the thorn in the flesh to cause them to turn away from God? Is asking that the thorn remain a kingdom first prayer? Well, not in that case. How do I know? What am I supposed to pray? What is the kingdom first prayer? And so it's all well and good to say, pray the kingdom first, but but how? I want to encourage you as you try to answer this question, not to fall for the cop-out. Not to fall for the cop-out. There's an easy cop-out. Because I'll tell you, here's what I did next. My next step, as I was struggling and, and frustrated and wondering, I said, I know. I'll just pray that God be glorified. That's a good prayer. And so I prayed for God's glory. I pray for God's glory a lot. Someone comes to me and says, I'm sick, pray for me. I'll pray that God be glorified. Someone comes to me and says, I lost my job. Pray for me. I'll pray. God be glorified. The elders are having a meeting. I'll pray that God be glorified. Guys, that is a wonderful prayer. And let me just point out to you that that is a great place to start. In fact, it has a fabulous precedent. We can find in John chapter 12 and verse 27. That Jesus has pointed out, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? We actually just sang this moments ago. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is a wonderful prayer. It is a beautiful prayer. And when it is a part of a larger and more robust prayer habit, as in Jesus' case, sometimes it's the only thing that needs to be prayed. 
But if it is the only thing that I ever pray, it's a cop-out. Because remember, the goal of prayer is for me to grow. And while it is true that what I want more than anything else is for God to be glorified, if that is the only thing I ever say in my prayers, I'm not growing to become more like God. I'm not learning what it is to be more like God. I'm not learning what it is to glorify God. I'm just saying it again and again and again. It kind of reminds me of a statement I read years ago when I was studying the Psalms from a fellow named J. Ellsworth Collis. He was commenting on Psalm 96, and he was specifically commenting on the idea of the new song. Why we would want to present a new song, as Psalm 96 declares right there in the first verse. Here's what he says. You've known the frustration, I'm sure, in the experiences of human friendship and love of saying to someone, I just wish I could find the words to tell you what what you mean to me or what our friendship means to me. So it is that the psalmist wants a new song. And his exuberance is such that he calls on everyone else to join his choir, all the earth, all the peoples. Let me ask you, have you ever wanted to say that to someone? I just, I just, I can't even come up with the words. I can't come up with the words to say how wonderful you are. He goes on to say this. But our wonderful spiritual ancestor doesn't say as we might, I can't find the words to express what I feel. He would see this, I think, as an unholy cop-out. So he launches into rolling phrases of praise, making us the richer for it. Oh, it is true that we could say that God is so amazing and so wonderful and so great that we just can't find the words. And that sounds meaningful and that sounds lovely. But we'd be a whole lot better trying to find words and expanding our praises And coming up with things that get close or as close as we can to talking about how wonderful and amazing God is. I just want to say that I see this point that we're making here very similar. It is true that what we want is for God to be glorified above all things. But if that's all we're ever saying, that's going to be a cop-out. We need to work at it. We need to grow at it. Because when we work at it and we grow at it, that's when we will be the richer for it. And so I encourage us to avoid the cop-out. I understand, of course, that as I work at this, I'm going to miss and fail sometimes. And that's why I want to make sure as we walk through this lesson that we remember Romans chapter 8. And verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So don't take the cop out. Work at it. Yes, sometimes you're going to mess it up. Most of the time, you're probably going to not even know you messed it up. But that's why we can trust that the Spirit is working on our behalf. If what I am doing is seeking the kingdom first, if what I'm doing is praying the kingdom first... I know that the Spirit is working on my behalf. And so I'm going to keep working at this and keep growing at this. So how? I'd like to share with you three keys. Rather than just going to the cop-out, let's, I want to share with you three keys that I think will help us grow in kingdom-first praying. The first key can be found in Jesus' model prayer that we've been looking at. It can be found when we look at his model prayer in reverse. Here's the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When we take a look at this prayer backwards, starting at this second half first, we find three requests. The request for daily provision, the request for forgiveness, and the request for deliverance. But what is the basis for these three requests? Do you notice that the the basis in Jesus' model prayer is not the pleasure or passions of the one praying? The basis of the prayer is not the 
comfort of the one praying. The basis of the prayer is not even the need of the one praying. In fact, Jesus already pointed out right before he gave this model prayer, God already knows what we need. So when this prayer is praying for daily food, for forgiveness and deliverance, the basis is not, oh Lord, it would just be awful for me to suffer. It would just be awful for me to be in pain. It would just be awful for me to be hungry. Don't you love me, Lord? If you loved me, you wouldn't let this kind of thing happen. That's not the basis. What's the basis? Well, let's go back up to the beginning now. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why should God respond to his three requests? Because in responding to these three requests, God's name is hallowed, his kingdom is spread, and his will is done. Do you see what this prayer accomplishes? Here's the key. Give God a reason to respond. Give God a reason to respond. When I share this key, please understand, I am not talking about trying to manipulate God. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, it is impossible for us to manipulate God. God. I am not trying to suggest to you that if you find a sentence or a promise or a passage in scripture that you can quote to God in prayer that somehow magically now he is going to be forced to give you everything you ask for. What I'm saying is we need to make sure to anchor our prayers in God. Anchor our prayers in something about God, in his nature, his character, his promises, his word, and his will. We need to ask and work through this thing that I'm about to bring before the throne of the holy God of the universe. Why? Why should or why would he remotely respond to this? And give God a reason to respond to your prayers. As shocking as that may sound, I would suggest to you it is one of the most consistent habits of prayer that we see throughout Scripture. We find it again and again and again that the strongest, most powerful prayers that we read about and witness in Scripture, those who were praying, gave God a reason to respond. Their prayers were anchored in God's word, God's will, God's way, and they stated it. I think one of the greatest examples is King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 19. In 2 Kings chapter 19, and if you are in a pew Bible, it's page 326. In 2 Kings 19, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, has conquered so many nations. He's even conquered the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And has been conquering cities in Judah. And has now come to Jerusalem. And listen to Hezekiah's prayer. O Lord, this is... 2 Kings 19, verse 15. O Lord, the God of Israel enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord. The kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand. Why? That all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Not Lord, deliver us because it would be awful for us to get killed. Lord, deliver us because it would be awful for my legacy to be destroyed. Lord, deliver us because I don't want to feel pain. Lord, deliver us because I want my kids protected. No, no. 
Lord, deliver us, because I want everyone in the world to know you, you, and only you are God. Giving God a reason. Anchoring in God's nature, his praise, his promise, his way. Consider another one. Some of the prayers that are most difficult for us to understand, like the one in Genesis chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18, and if you're in a pew Bible, this is going to be found on page 13. In Genesis chapter 18, God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he comes and he lets Abraham know what's coming, and Abraham starts to barter with him. Now guys, we don't have time in this lesson to talk about all of the things that we might learn and all the questions that we might ask regarding this bartering, but I just want you to hear Abraham's prayer. This is in Genesis 18, 23. Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Do you see what he does with this prayer? He says, God, I know who you are. I know what kind of God you are. I know that you're the judge, but I know that the judge of all the earth is just. And so I ask you to do the just thing. If there are 50 righteous, will you destroy him? And God honors that prayer. And he says, you know what? For 50, I won't. And Abraham gets him all the way down to 10. And for all the questions we have, I just want us to see this. What did Abraham do with his prayer? He gave God a reason. Look at Numbers 14. This is another one of those prayers that we ask a lot of questions about. We don't have time to get into all the important lessons. You can find this on page 122 if you're in a pew Bible. But in Numbers chapter 14, in Numbers chapter 14, Israel, the first generation coming out of Egypt, has decided not to go into the land, and God has judging them, and he's actually said to Moses, you know what I want you to do, Moses? I want you to get out of the way. I'm going to wipe these people out, and I'm going to start over with you. Here's Moses' prayer. This is in Numbers chapter 14, verse 13. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land, they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give to them that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now, please, let the power of the Lord be great as As you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Again, we don't have time to get into all the wonderful, amazing lessons that we can get from this prayer. Do you notice, though, that what Moses did was he gave God a reason, in fact, two reasons. Number one, Lord God, if you wipe them out, Egypt's going to hear about it, and they won't praise you. They'll think you weren't able. they would think you're not powerful. But then the second reason, but you told us your name. You told me your name. Your name is a name of forgiveness. Your name is a name of steadfast love. Treat us according to your name. What does he do? He anchors the prayer in God. He anchors the prayer in God's character, in God's purposes, in God's promises. He gives God a reason. One more example, and we could do this over and over all day long, but I'm going to give you one more example. One of the most common examples of powerful prayer is that of Elijah. In fact, James, in James chapter 5, brings up Elijah as this wonderful example of a man with a nature like ours, but he prayed that it would not rain, and for three and a half years it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, we just see Elijah's statement that it's not going to rain. So we don't see a whole lot about his prayer. But I do know that James 5, verses 16 and 17 right in there, has caused Christians no limit of consternation about our prayers. Because here's Elijah, a man of faith, who prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain, and so now we have our outdoor wedding, or we've got our potluck at the park, or we've got whatever event that's going on outside, and we pray, Lord, don't let it rain. And what does it do? 
It rains, thank you. (laughs) And we think, oh no. Do I not have faith? Does prayer not work? Is God not listening? That's not what's happening at all. The fact is, Elijah's prayer in his case is very different from our prayer in that case. And I know that because of Deuteronomy chapter 11. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, God speaks to his people about their time in the land. If you're in the Pew Bible, this is page 155. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 16, here is what God promises. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. By the way, James, when he refers to Elijah, actually refers back to this passage when he talks about the heaven then gave rain and bore fruit. Do you see that when Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, he wasn't just praying, Lord, I really don't want it to rain. It would benefit me. It would be nice for me. I'd have a good time. It'll be pleasing to me and my friends. If on this day it would not rain, what was Elijah praying? Elijah was praying, dear Lord, Keep your promise. You said if Israel went into idolatry, you'd stop the rain. And so I'm praying, Lord, stop the rain. Do you understand? That even without specifically stating, we don't know exactly what Elijah prayed because that's not revealed. But what we do know is that Elijah's prayer for it to stop raining was actually anchored in God. It was giving God a reason to respond because it was his promise that that was what was supposed to happen. We could do this all day, guys. This is the number one key. In fact, it's so, it's so much the number one key, it's what I named the sermon, give God a reason. But of course, we ask ourselves, how, how am I supposed to know what the reasons are? How do I get to know God and his will and his promises and his way? so that I can anchor and give God a reason. This brings us to our second key. And our second key, we find in Jesus' teaching about the vine and the branches. And there in John chapter 15, well, this is what you get for copying and pasting. It's not Matthew 6, 9 through 13. This is John chapter 15, and I think about verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Please understand what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying if you read your Bible every day, all of your wildest dreams will come true. Jesus is not saying if you memorize the entire New Testament, everything you ever ask, I'll give it to you. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that the person who abides in him and the person whom his words abide in wants the right things. And therefore, pray whatever you wish, And I'll do it. The Bible is not a magic lamp. Jesus is not a genie that dwells inside it. But when the word of God dwells inside us and governs us and grows us and changes what we want and what we value, it's going to change what we pray. And so key number two, abide in God's word and pray for whatever you want. But understand this. As you are growing in God's word, what you want is going to change. And you're going to find that there are things that you used to pray for that you can no longer summon the Bible-based, God-word-based faith to pray about anymore. But I'll tell you what you will find. 
you will find that there are things that you can summon the Bible-based, God-word-focused, centered faith to pray for things you never thought you could pray for. It'll work both ways. And while you're in the growth process, this is why I wanted you to remember Romans 8, 26. I get it. We're going to get it wrong. But when we're walking through this process, the Spirit intercedes for us. So abide in the Word and let the Word abide in you and pray for what you want. Because as you grow, what you want will become more kingdom-focused. Of course, (laughs) the struggle here is is that no matter what all we know, we still may get it wrong. The reality is, I may see something and, and in my mind think this goes right along with the will and the word of God. In fact, I can find a Bible verse that shows this is what God wants and I'm going to pray for this. And it may just not be part of God's plan. And it may be that God understands something that we don't understand. And so what do I do in that case? What, what, if, I'm, what if I'm wrong? So we find this third key in perhaps Jesus' most famous prayer. The one that he prayed in the garden when his soul was deeply troubled. And he took the disciples to Gethsemane and he took the inner circle a little bit farther along and then he even went a little bit farther along and he fell on his face. And he prayed the following prayer. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Honestly, guys, here's what I find most fascinating about this prayer. What I find most fascinating about this prayer is that Jesus actually knew what the Father's will was in this. He knew what was coming next. And yet he still laid out before God, here's my desire, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. If Jesus, when he knew the Father's will, prayed like this, how much more should we, when we're confused and not sure and still growing, also pray like this? And so this provides for us our third key, and that is want God's will more than you want your own. Want God's will more than you want your own. And have the humility to recognize that for all the studying I've done and all the growing I've done, I may not have it right in this one. But I'm going to lay out my desire. I'm abiding in the word. Here's what I want. I'm going to pray. But Lord, more than what I want, I want what you want. And please understand, brothers and sisters, this is more than just saying that out loud. This is also how we react to God's responses. Because if God says no, and we decide to abandon him, we clearly didn't want God's will more than our own. Lord God, I trust you. I know that your way works. And I know that I don't always know what it is. And so I'm going to lay out before you, here's what I want, if this is possible. But I want you to know, Father, more than this thing I'm saying to you right now, I want whatever it is you want. Now, guys, let's come full circle. Let's not let that become our new cop-out. We need to pray that. That needs to be a part of our praying. But if we're going to grow in kingdom-first praying, then we're going to do the work at giving God the reason, at being in his word and anchoring our prayers to him, to his will, his word, his nature, his promises, his character. We're going to give God a reason to respond. Guys, here's what I want you to know. 
kingdom first praying is not easy. It's hard. And when we start trying to pursue kingdom first praying, That is when we begin to understand why in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12, when Paul referred to Epaphras, he said to the Colossians, I want you to know about Epaphras who struggles in prayer for you. For most of my life, I didn't struggle in prayer. I just struggled to pray. You know what I'm saying? But that's not what he's saying about Epaphras. It's not that Epaphras struggled to pray. It's that he struggled in prayer. Why? Because praying, kingdom first praying, is not easy. And I, I know why, as new Christians come into the kingdom, we try to tell them things that make it seem like praying is easy because we want them to get started. And, and that's probably all well and good. But guys, don't we all know that very few things worth doing are easy? And kingdom first praying is hard. And I need to not just ask, what do I care about? I need to ask, why do I care about this? And I need to ask, what should I care about this? I need to answer those questions from God and his word and bring those prayers to him. And so guys, I know as we're wrapping up here, my invitation to you this morning is actually a very difficult one. Because I want to ask you to do something when it comes to praying that I think is going to be a little bit off-putting to all of us. And I want, you to, I want to ask you to start doing it for yourself and for others. And that is, start asking why. Why? Why should I pray for this? Why would God remotely respond to this? In fact, guys, you want to know one of the things that would make us as a church grow spiritually the greatest? Is if we started asking that to one another. Somebody comes to us and asks us to pray and we just ask, why? I know that seems odd, and I know, listen, I know, guys, so I could be way off base. And if you think I'm way off base, that's fine. My email is edwin at godswayworks.com. Feel free to email me or call me. Please don't attack me on the way out the door. There's lots of people here. So if I'm way off base, that's fine. But I just ask you to consider this. Someone comes up and says, trying to get a new job, would you pray for me? Why? Why would God remotely respond to this request? Why do you want the new job? Do you want the new job so you can have a nicer house? So you can eat better? So you can have a better retirement? Or do you want the nicer job because it's going to give you more funds to be able to share with those who have less? Or do you want the nicer job? I mean, why? What's the kingdom first reason for this? All right, guys, here's a hard one. Someone says on Facebook, I got diagnosed with COVID today. Pray for me. Why? Why would God respond to that? Pray that my symptoms will be easy. Okay, why? Why would God respond to that? Pray, pray that I survive. Okay, why? Guys, I know we don't normally think like that. That's crazy. But do you remember that blessed are the dead who die in the Lord? So when I ask God to let people survive, especially Christians, I'm asking him to hold off in a blessing. We don't ever think about that, do we? So why? What's the kingdom first reason? You know, what if... What if God's plan right here with you having COVID is that you go into the hospital and and you set an example for a doctor or a nurse who decides to become a Christian and goes on to convert a thousand patients? What if that's what God's planning on doing with this? 
So why? What's the kingdom first reason? As we're thinking through this, what is the kingdom first reason? Maybe it's because I need to raise my kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, still. Maybe it's because I, I've, got, I've got somebody I'm teaching the gospel to, and I, I need to keep teaching them. I, I don't know. But why? All right, what about this? Somebody comes up to you and says, my marriage is on the rocks. Pray for me. I mean, guys, surely, if there's anything that's kingdom first, it's praying for people's marriages, right? But let me ask, what if you asked Why? Why would God respond to this request? What is your request? What request are you actually having? Is your request, I just want to be happy, and marriage is supposed to make me happy, and it's not making me happy, so please pray for my marriage so that I can be happy? Or is it, I know that my marriage is supposed to represent Jesus and his church, and it's not doing that right now, so would you please pray for my marriage? What's the kingdom first request? Why would God respond to this? Again, I'm not saying we're not allowed to pray for what we want. Pray for what you want as you're staying in God's word. But sometimes we should probably ask, why would God respond to this? What am I going to do with it if he responds to it? Give God a reason. How are you doing with that? If you'd like to, you can put your notes away in your Bibles. We're going to sing one more song here. Guys, as we wrap up, let me just point out, this is actually one of the hardest lessons I've ever had to preach. And I'll just tell you why. Because what I want to say to you is prayer is easy. Just go do it. I'm just not sure I can say that anymore. What I have to say is prayer is hard. But just go do it. Get in God's word and let it change you in the way you pray. Learn God. Get to know God. And let that change you to be more like him. Because, guys, that's what prayer is about. Prayer is not about getting what I want. It's about making me what God wants me to be. And I am convinced that that comes by praying the kingdom first. And so I share that with you this morning. But as we close, I do want you to understand that there's no amount of prayer that is going to help you or glorify God if you are not one of his children. If you aren't in the kingdom, if you aren't accepting the kingdom, if you're not knocking on that gate coming into the kingdom, there's nothing I can tell you about prayer that's going to help you. And so for right now, we're going to sing a song. And what we do here, this is what we call our invitation song. We're inviting you to be a part of this kingdom. We're inviting you to walk through the narrow gate and walk on the narrow path. To knock on that door. And the way you do it, Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the King, the Son of God? Then give your allegiance to him in baptism. Turn away from your own life and follow him, confessing him as king. Being laid out before him in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. If we can help you with that this morning, won't you please come forward right now as we stand and sing this song.